Okay, uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I think since we're a little bit behind schedule, I think I'll try to go a little bit faster, but um, I just want to start off by saying that for me, the opportunity to work on climate change really began about 14 years ago when I was working on my textbook. Um, I realized that all the examples from climate change were from faraway places like Swiss Alps or northern Canada or Alaska. And I was wondering why we can't find examples of climate change from anywhere, just anywhere around Boston, for example, or just outside of this building. And so for the last 14 years, my students and I have been investigating the effects of climate change just on the plants and animals right around here in New England. Um, but the approach that we've chosen to take um, is really something that you could really do anywhere in the United States or, or anywhere in the world. And that's what I'm going to describe to you. Also, over the last 14 years, uh, there's been the rise of the whole citizen science movement or field. And we've sort of uh, partnered with that movement and increasingly worked with citizen scientists or volunteers in our project. And what I'm going to do is to describe to you this process of how we can work as ecologists, conservation biologists, climate change biologists, and also uh, be involved as citizen scientists and all work together to investigate human impacts on the planet. Well, you can start off by looking at the change in temperature. And this is just the change in temperature in the city of Boston from the 1850s when Thoreau was active uh, in Concord uh, through to the present time. And you can see that even though we have extremely variable weather in the Boston area, that uh, the trend is toward warming temperatures. And in particular, we had these extraordinarily warm years in 2010, which I thought we would never see a year like that again in my lifetime. And then two years later, 2012, we had another, breaking, uh, warm, another record breaking year in terms of warm weather. I should also point out that this, uh, the y-axis here is in uh, the average temperatures for the months of March and April, the spring months in degrees centigrade. So the idea is that you can really look anywhere in the, in the world and you can see temperature effects, or almost anywhere in the world and see temperature effects. You can particularly see them in urban areas like Boston, where we not only have global warming, but we also have warming associated with urbanization. So most of the warming in the Boston area is really urbanization warming. But in addition to these warming effects, we also have rainfall patterns which are changing, particularly in places like California and other Mediterranean climates in the world. They're often getting drier and hotter. Uh, sea levels are rising in Boston. The sea levels have risen by about eight inches from historical times. Um, and that makes Boston extremely vulnerable to flooding as, for example, New Orleans or, or New York City. So Boston is also very vulnerable already to rising sea levels, but it's going to get more vulnerable. And sea level can be studied um, in any seacoast area in the world. And also carbon dioxide levels are rising. And this is something that we're, we really haven't started to investigate very much, but yet plant communities are probably changing and responding to rising CO2 levels since carbon dioxide is often one of the limiting factors in plant growth. So these are all things that scientists can investigate and also citizen scientists, volunteers, the general public can also investigate these things because they're happening right around us. They're happening everywhere. It's everywhere in the world that carbon dioxide levels are rising. And there are some pretty easy things that you can monitor. These things don't really require uh, very much technical equipment or training. Um, some, of them, some of the things we, can, we want to measure with climate change are very technical, but a lot of the very basic ones, um, you can just go out there and make observations on your own. So for example, the, the one factor which we have the most information on about the effects of climate change is on phenology or the timing of biological events. So we actually have more information about the flowering time and leafing out of plants and the migration time of birds than any other phenomenon associated with climate change aside from the physical ones like temperature or sea level rise. But the second factor which we have a lot of information for is the distribution of species. So people have been monitoring, for example, the distribution of birds and butterflies for hundreds of years. And by looking at these changing patterns of species, we can also see indications of climate change. And again, volunteers and scientists work together to look at these changing distributions. 
And then also the abundance of species. There's a lot of information out there about how common birds are or how common butterflies are. And again, scientists working together with volunteers can be recording th this type of information. This type, this type of, of, of observations of the timing of events and the distribution of species and the abundance of species is really increasing very rapidly right now because of citizen science networks. So we have organizations like Earthwatch, which have very intensive projects in particular places and very intensive monitoring in individual places. But we also have that linked to very large networks of scientists from large geographical areas. And these kinds of large citizen science networks are expanding at a phenomenal rate at the present time, um, mostly because of the internet. So the internet allows people to be aware of these networks over large areas and to contribute their observations using online systems. So this is really kind of the, a huge development which is occurring in the United States, in China, in Europe, and many other countries. And this is really one of the biggest changes which is occurring in the ability of ecologists, environmental scientists, uh, climate change biologists to really look at things over a large area. Also, of course, with computers and the cloud, people can store large amounts of data and analyze it. And this really can create all kinds of interesting international opportunities for research. So I just want to mention that several of these networks, which are just enormous networks, which are being set up at the present time. Um, one is the National Phenology Network, which focuses on plants and animals all around the United States and, and adjacent countries, where people can contribute observations about when things are happening and where they're happening. Um, another one focusing a little bit more on plants and education is called Project Budburst. And probably the most successful one of all is called eBird, which many of you have heard about, which allows birders to contribute their observations to national and international networks. So it allows ornithologists to get the information of, of tens of thousands, of hundreds, th hundreds of thousands of birders all around the world and allows birders to participate in international scientific efforts. But also, the eBird program provides value to the birders because the eBird database keeps track of the birds that particular birders have seen, and so it can make up a life list for them and also can tell them when they've seen birds in the past. And so these, these networks allow the creation of standardized data collection systems for huge geographical areas and again uses the internet and uh, web-based entry systems to allow people to enter their data very easily into these systems. Uh, one example, one of my favorite is, is Journey North, which is really primarily set up to allow school children to contribute observations of the movement of monarch butterflies. And for the last dozen or so years, they've been creating these maps or databases which you can use to create maps like this, which show the migration of monarch butterflies into uh, North America from the late winter on into the spring and summer. And you can see that using observations that people have contributed that we have overwintering butterflies mostly in the Mexican highlands, but interestingly enough on the coast of Texas and in Florida and along the California coast, there are overwintering butterflies, contrary to what you read in the popular press. And starting in the late winter, these butterflies start migrating out into the southern United States. Then they're found in the mid-Atlantic states and then gradually further north in the United States and then into Canada by the end of June. So using these kinds of networks contributed by school children and by citizen scientists, we can actually not only look at the rate of migration of butterflies into North America, but we can also get an idea of the abundance of butterflies. We can track the abundance, the changing abundance of butterflies over successive years. And these systems like Journey North have proved to be very successful in both climate change, uh, biology, and also for the conservation of these, butterf these butterflies in terms of tracking how their numbers are changing over time. So we've also been involved in these kinds of citizen science networks. Uh, so we've created something which is called the New England Leaf Out Project, where we've tried to build on what the, uh, the National Phenology Network and Project Budburst are doing. So Project Budburst and, and the National Phenology Network are great because they have, include lots of species over a large area. But their disadvantage is that they often don't have information, a lot of information from a specific place. And so we decided we would create a very intensive network of observers from the New England region who would just 
look, record the leafing out time of trees, and we would be able to match this with the same information from satellite remote sensing. We also tried to create a system which was as easy as possible for people to enter data. So basically, all you had to do was click on the species that you were looking at, the date you saw it, and you would click a button, and you could contribute your observations in about 15 seconds. So this was a contrast to some of the other systems where you have to register as, as, a, as an observer, and you have to include your location and a lot of information about yourself before you can contribute a, an observation. So this is really complementary to these existing systems, so very intensive local systems, in this case New England, to combining with these more national systems. One of the most powerful approach that um, our research group has been involved in is trying to develop an approach toward climate change research where we find old records and combine old records with modern observations gathered by ourselves and with networks of citizen science. And I think that this is one of the most powerful ways for investigating climate change. And there, it's amazing what kind of old records are out there when you go looking for them. And so in the New England area, we found a lot of records. But some of the oldest records in the world are from Europe and from Japan. And probably the oldest and most amazing record of phytology which exists is the timing of the Cherry Blossom Festival in Kyoto, Japan, which goes back to the 9th century. So there are records of the date of the Cherry Blossom Festival, the date when the, when the cherry trees are in peak flower, going back to the early um, 800s in Japan. And you can see that there's a lot of variation in terms of when it's uh, celebrated. But beginning in the around 1900, there's been this pretty dramatic progression toward earlier flowering time of cherries in the Kyoto area. This is actually in part due to global warming, but actually the largest contributor of early, earlier flowering time in Kyoto was actually urbanization. So it's actually about two thirds urbanization and about one third global warming, which is driving this ever earlier flowering time of cherry trees in Kyoto. But it's an amazing record which can be looked at. And a lot of these records, uh, of course these records were not gathered by scientists, they were mostly gathered by uh, people who are in the, the royal court or just regular citizens um, in the Kyoto area and recording the, these observations um, in their diaries. So the challenge of, that we face as scientists and where the general public, citizen scientists, can really be very useful is to find old records gathered by citizens in the past, because these are mostly not gathered by scientists, but to find old records diaries or other types of information gathered by scientists, digitize them, uh, and then make them available in online formats so that scientists and other people can use them in climate change research. Also, one of the things which is really very dramatic about citizen science records from the past is that they have advantages and disadvantages. There's always stories with these data sets. And if you don't know the story, you make mistakes. For example, the, the cherry records that I just showed you are actually very dramatic, but you, of course you would have to know that urbanization is one of the things which is you have to interpret in these records. Also, in the 1870s, they changed over the species that they were using for the, for the uh, cherry blossom festival in, in Japan. And you have to know the biology of these cherry trees to appreciate the fact that they were using one kind of cherry, and then they changed over to a different cherry in the 1870s, and that can affect the data. So you have to be aware of the limitations um, of old data sets, particularly when they're gathered by uh, people who are not scientists. So there are just some incredible opportunities out there. And one example is that in the Boston area, one thing that we have which is so unique is museums with huge numbers of records, of huge amounts of, of research materials, often not gathered with the intention of climate change. So, for example, at the Arnold Arboretum, they have not, in the past, gathered records of when plants were flowering on the grounds of the Arnold Arboretum, but they have a herbarium there which has over 100,000 herbarium specimens, 100,000 museum specimens, which were, all, which were mostly collected when the plants were in peak flower, and they have labels on them which describe not only when the specimen was collected, but also the numbered plant that it was collected from. And so what my 
students, and I particularly one student who, former student who's here, Abe Miller Rushing. Uh, actually, where's Abe? Where's Abe? Raise your hand. Okay, Abe's back there. Okay, look at Abe there. So Abe, Abe and I did this work. So Abe and I did this work a dozen years ago. Um, so here's rhododendron plant number 20,953. So this is the plant in full flower um, on May 3rd, 2010. And this is, when, this is when it was collected in 1938, on May 19th, 1938. And so by going out there, Abe and I, with a lot of uh, volunteers from the Arnold Arboretum and students from Boston University, by going out there and making observations about when the plants are flowering today with when the plants were in peak flower on the in the past using these museum specimens, uh, we were able to document that the plants at the Arnold Arboretum are now flowering about two weeks earlier than they did in the past and that they, f and they flower earlier in warmer years than in cold years. Now, there's a lot of problems with this methodology. There are certain issues with this kind of technique, but in general, it's an effective way to look at, at, at how climate change is affecting the flowering time of plants. Another great opportunity for uh, citizens is to be involved in uh, looking at historical photographs and seeing how things have changed from when they were photographed in the past and what they're doing today. And there are huge collections of, of old photographs everywhere in the United States, but particularly in the New England region. And there's lots of people taking photographs today at the Arnold Arboretum or just around Boston or really anywhere. And by matching old photographs with modern photographs, you can often see some amazing things. And uh, Abe and I were once giving a talk, and after the talk, a, a woman came up to us, and she said she had a very specialized hobby. She liked to collect old photographs taken from historically important cemeteries, and preferably stereoscopic photographs that you can use and see in three dimensions, and then also that were taken on Memorial Day. So she had a very specialized hobby, and... <laughs> She said that of, of all the photographs that she had in her collection, there was one that looked really different from the others, and could we take a look at it? So she showed us this photograph here, taken on May 30th, 1868, at the Lowell Cemetery, and there's something which looks pretty strange about this photograph, and what is it? No leaves. And so um, Abe Miller Rushing and I spent a lot of time investigating 1868, and what we found out was that 1868 was one of the so-called years with no spring. And it was a year in which uh, there were, there were hard-killing frosts all through uh, March, April, May, and June. And so this was a, uh, a, a very dramatic time, uh, very cold weather, and this prevented the plants from leafing out the way they were supposed to. And I think I'm, uh, should you, have you give me a two-minute warning? Okay. Okay. Okay, because I've been talking for 16 minutes. Okay, okay. So um, the most amazing citizen scientist from this region is Henry David Thoreau. So Henry David Thoreau made observations of plant flowering times um, from 1851 to 1858. And by matching Thoreau's observations uh, from this five-year period uh, with current observations, we can again see the effects of climate change. And so this is a graph of... of a figure from one of our publications, and we have from the 1850s to the present time the uh, flowering times of plants of 30 common wildflower species. And in Thoreau's years, there was a lot of variation, but in general, the plants are flowering around May 14th. In, um, in another naturalist from Concord named Hosmer, there was uh, a lot of variation. He also observed the same species, a lot of variation, but plants are flowering around May 10th. And in the present years, the nine or eight present years, a lot of variation when plants flower in Concord. Each one of these symbols is, an, is the average flowering time of 32 common wildflower species. And you can see that plants have shifted by about four days in terms of their, their shifted by about 10 days in terms of their flowering time from Thoreau's time to the present. And every time we've, we've done one of our studies from Concord, we've always written an article about it in the scientific journals, but we've also written a press release and it's been covered in the, in the popular media as well. It's been covered in the New York Times because this is an exciting story about how things have changed since the time of Thoreau. Uh, we find that there's a lot of bird data out there. There's an enormous amount of, of bird data out there. Um, in addition to plant data, there's uh, so many birders and bird organizations and banding stations. And you can take all this data which is out there, 
particularly old observations, match them with current observations, and you can see the effects of, of climate change on birds. The interesting thing, though, is that birds are not changing their migration time as much as the plants are changing. The plants are changing by 10 days to two weeks in the New England area because of climate change. They're happening earlier, and the birds are only migrating a couple of days earlier. So there's the potential for an ecological mismatch between birds and plants, which we and many others are investigating. So climate change provides a lot of opportunities for volunteers and citizen scientists to investigate uh, the changing environments. Most of the research has been focused on the spring, but there's a lot of opportunities, especially in New England, for looking at how climate change is affecting the autumn, how climate change is affecting the urban environments, uh, how climate change is affecting the rising sea level. And this is all something which you can do either as part of Earthwatch projects or as these citizen science networks or just as individuals in keeping your own diaries. So in these kinds of projects, citizen scientists have the opportunity to learn how the scientific process is done and to learn a lot of natural history and also to contribute to the scientific process and also to contribute to the kinds of results that um, that scientists are, are getting in, the, in their work. Uh, one of my favorite quotes of Thoreau is, we cannot see anything until we are possessed with the idea of it, take it into our heads, and then we can hardly see anything else. And I think that this is the way I feel sometimes, that 12 years ago I didn't think very much about climate change, and now I see climate change is happening everywhere. Um, so I'm writing articles about it, and then as Meg mentioned, uh, after reading a lot of the articles that journalists wrote about our research, I finally decided that I would try to tell the whole story in my own words. And so I wound up writing a popular book about all the research which my students and colleagues and I have been doing. And it's this book, Walden Warming, Climate Change to Thoreau's Woods. And after my talk, you're all welcome to purchase a copy, or you're welcome to purchase a copy if you want. Um, so we're selling the copies back there. And with that, I finish. Uh, thank, and thank you very much for your attention. So we'll have two quick questions because that topic is so interesting for these local Bostonians. Raise your hand and our mics will be delivered. I see that you have um, data for flowering times, but no data for the first hard freeze. In my garden, I always look for the first hard freeze. And is one um, set of data more valuable than the other? The you spring. Mean, you mean freezing in the spring or in the autumn? The freezing in the spring. Uh, freezing in the autumn. Right. Okay. So there's a, a very big effort right now. So in the past, autumn was really <laughs> neglected in climate change research, and so. One of the things that we and many other research groups are doing now is increasingly focusing on the effects of climate change on autumn. And we know, for example, with birds, there's a lot of bird studies coming out recently letting us know that birds are actually, most birds are actually staying longer in the autumn because the temperatures are milder. Also, the trees are holding their leaves longer. And also, the first frost is also happening later if you look at long-term weather records. So the autumn has really been the neglected season in climate change research. And this is something that there's a, a huge effort going into at the present time. One more, thank you. Have you seen anything done with scanning technology to help more lay people scan in pictures if they cannot identify certain species? OK, that's, that's a great question. Um, so one of the problems, it's, it's, it's an interesting contrast between birders and people working on plants. that. There's a huge level of expertise about bird identification, and birders you know, generally just take a tremendous effort to really know all the birds, uh, though there is a lot of checking when people submit observations if they seem a little bit strange as to what really bird they did see. But the, level, the general level of expertise of plants in the United States is surprisingly low. People really have difficulty identifying even the most common wildflowers and the most common uh, trees. And so we, on, on our website, where we ask people to submit observations of leafing out time, we, we actually include a lot of characteristics of, for identification of those species based on bark and leaves and fruits. Um, and if people have any questions, we encourage them to send us photographs. But this is kind of a challenge for you know, the United States of, of the level of expertise on plants. I have a colleague in China. In China, they have these vast 
numbers of plant taxonomists, people who really specialize in plant taxonomy. And there, there are just hundreds of scientists who, who as one of their main activities, people will send in photographs to them and they'll identify the plants based on photographs. So this is something we really need to move toward in the United States. There's actually something also being developed by the New England Wildflower Society called Go Botany, where it's, it's a system which is ex, an extremely user-friendly system for the identification of plants. It's an online system. So that's a very good resource also. Okay. A big thanks to Richard. That's an amazing talk. Thank you so much.